Hello, it's Dr. Keller. And uh, due to uh, all the weather that we've been having, uh, we didn't have uh, any lectures this week. So they're all going to be on YouTube. And I'm going to record the last one prior to exam two. Uh, this is uh, lecture three, part two. And we're going to be looking at the skeletal system. And we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, different types of diseases. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. You should be able to see my screen now. And uh, the first slide in this deck that we're going to be talking about straight up is uh, osteoporosis. And osteoporosis is a very interesting disease. It's uh, had a lot of attention, I think, in the literature, uh, also in uh, uh, social media, as well as the mainstream media and the scientific and clinical literature. 50% uh, of the elderly who experience a hip fracture, they never walk again. And so when we start looking at why hip fractures are prevalent in elderly, uh, it's because of this disease known as osteoporosis. So this is a disease where we lose a tremendous amount of bone mass, uh, mostly of the cancellous tissue. It's most common in elderly women, although men do develop osteoporosis. And kind of this trigger point or this cliff that we see is right at the onset of menopause or when the uh, women's regular menstrual cycle stops. We're going to talk a little bit about prevention um, in this lecture, and then we'll talk even about some uh, drug interventions uh, that, that make sense. So prevention comes in the format of trying to build as much bone in your childhood and your teen years. And that's really the take-home message there. And then the treatment, or once a woman gets to the age of menopause, we have different types of estrogen therapies or supplementation that happens. Some women can't handle those. So in, in other situations, we'll use drugs like what's called Fosamax that encourages osteoblast activity to develop new bone. So you can appreciate here on the left image, we've got normal bone. And then we have osteoporotic bone. And hopefully you can really just visibly see the difference between the two. And <clears throat> this happens throughout the entire body. It's not just in one location. But of course, the weight-bearing hips, um, where you've got the femoral head inserting into the acetabulum of the pelvis. Uh, as we get older, we lose our sense of balance. So we become a little bit more wobbly, un unstable, and we tend to fall. And if that bone is weak, then that's where there's going to be a fracture or a potential for a fracture. We can see fractures at hip, wrist, as well as in the vertebrae. In the vertebral column, uh, in this image, you can see there's some compression of, of the disc in between the vertebrae. We can uh, clearly see uh, right here where my cursor is, is the vertebrae actually touching. So we kind of have bone on bone. And in this uh, woman, this elderly woman from from a lateral aspect, you can uh, appreciate or see uh, an exaggerated kyphotic angle or thoracic kyphotic angle, and that's you know this this hunchback situation that we um, that we tend to see in older patients in men as well. So all of this underscores the importance of bone health, and that's what we're going to look at uh, today. Just a highlight of this uh, histology or this gross image um, that we have uh, in sort of a slice or a histological view where we've got normal bone on the left, osteoporotic bone on the right. Now in osteoporosis, we've got this situation where we, we have bone resorption that outpaces bone deposition. And so it's a disease of bone that leads to an increase of fracture where our bone mineral density, abbreviated BMD, is reduced and the architecture of the bone is altered. And now all of a sudden we have non-collagenous proteins that's being varied uh, in the bone and we've got structural deficit. It's defined by the World Health Organization as a bone mineral density that's 2.5 times below, uh, standard deviations below peak bone mass. And peak bone mass is at about the age of probably the average age of this class, 20 years of age. And this is usually measured by an equipment called dexaometry or DXA as an abbreviation. 
It's basically a fancy x-ray. It's most common in women uh, after menopause or postmenopausal, where we refer to it as um, postmenopausal osteoporosis, but it can develop in men. It can occur in anyone that has hormonal disorders or some other type of chronic underlying disease as a result of medications or potent anti-inflammatories like glucocorticosteroids. Um, and uh, in this lecture, we kind of highlight uh, older women because that's the prevalence. But what I want you to be able to appreciate is in the United States, we have a population of about 10 million patients that already have been diagnosed with osteoporosis. Another 18 million uh, patients have low bone mass uh, that places them at a higher risk of developing osteoporosis. And 80% of those that are osteoporotic are women. And so that's the reason we tend to focus more on women than men when we talk about osteoporosis, but it is not a female only disease. In older people that are over 50 years of age, one in two women and one in eight men are predicted to have some sort of fracture related to the osteoporosis in their lifetime. So this is really a big deal. It's really, uh, I would say it's a pandemic that we've been wrestling with for years in the scientific and clinical space. So how do we treat this? Well. Um, medications include, like we mentioned before, estrogens. Estrogens help to slow or stop bone loss, but uh, some women cannot handle estrogen replacement. It just does weird things to their body, which kind of makes sense. Like if your body's saying, hey, I think I'm done making the estrogen that I've made most of my life, and then you try to replenish it, the body may or may not respond well to that. But these can be taken orally or as a transdermal skin patch. Some examples that are listed here, Chimera or Estroderm. And then CERBs, these are going after the receptor to estrogen. Instead of delivering more of the hormone, you deliver or you upregulate um, the sensitivity of the receptor for estrogen. So even though you have lower estrogen, you raise the sensitivity of the receptor the limited amount of estrogen that's still on board physiologically may still have the ability to benefit the patient uh, with a higher increase in the estrogen receptor or the selective estrogen receptor modulator, CIRMS. An example here is rel reloxifen, and um, these um, are well utilized for patients that are at risk for breast cancer or patients that have been diagnosed with breast cancer or maybe in remission. You wouldn't want to give a breast cancer patient estrogen replacement because it would make the breast cancer worse. Uh, two that are uh, more of my favorites, I would say, or the bottom list is more of my favorites because they're a little bit more natural, calcium and vitamin D. So you see a lot of elderly patients taking calcium supplements or vitamin D supplements. Um, and you know the, now you understand the physiology and the relationship of vitamin D, which really starts manufacturing itself at the level of the skin in um, uh, sunny environments or when you're exposed to UV light. But the skin and the bone, which are connected, which is really interesting about uh, the body, these physiologic systems are not standalone systems. They all are interrelated, right? And we've studied skin and bones. Um, not only are they related with vitamin D, but they have vascular throughout. So the vascular system, the cardiovascular system perfuses the skin, as well as the bones. And that's why calcium can circulate within our bloodstream and be deposited into the bones, or it can be liberated out of the bones. Another one is, uh, uh, from a treatment standpoint, are uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, some examples like Fosamax or Merck or Baniva, and this upregulates the amount of uh, phosphate that's available in, um, in the bone. So we're looking at the non-organic uh, components. The last one known as calcitonin. Calcitonin is a hormone um, that um, you know, regulates calcium balance that we looked at in the last lecture. And so you can take supplements known as like my calcinin. And this is a hormone that comes out of fish or salmon that tends to slow bone loss and may increase bone density. It has an activity like calcitonin where it starts to lay down additional bone. So these are all ways that we can treat or medications or strategies to try to minimize um, the progression of osteoporosis as we get older. 
I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about some other um, kind of cutting edge technologies. Uh, I mean, this one came out in the market a while ago, years ago, but it really kind of underscores, I think, where science and medicine sort of overlap. And this device, which is a, uh, a bone graft um, that's been infused into a lumbar fusion device. So in the spine, uh, if we think back to those uh, vertebral column images, a lot of times as we get older for the spine, we'll fuse segments of the vertebrae. We'll put in appliances like a plate and screws that kind of hold it in place and keep it separated so you don't have bone on bone. Well, this company actually incorporated a recombinant bone morphogenic protein. So that's the small RH down here, BMP2. This is a bone morphogenic protein, which actually stimulates bone to lay down. It actually triggers osteoblastic activity. And these kind of components to try to incorporate more bone going into a metal device that we implant would be extremely valuable in a hip. And so I think in the future, as you move into your clinical field, you're gonna see more of these biologically modulated devices that are elegantly constructed with some science in them that you'll be able to understand. You'll understand, okay, well, if I'm gonna put this in um, this patient, an elderly patient, let's say this patient's 78 years of age, and they fell and they had a hip fracture, maybe I actually don't wanna use a off the shelf kind of unmodified uh, piece of titanium alloy metal. I actually wanna use this recombinant bone morphogenic protein coated device to try to stimulate more bone remodeling and incorporation into the hip. So let's take a peek at a clinical um, presentation, kind of similar to what I just described. We'll look at uh, unmodulated uh, appliances that are implanted, but I wanted to walk you through this. So this is actually a real case that came from an orthopedic colleague of mine. And so we just abbreviate their name for HIPAA compliance. But uh, this female, uh, this woman is 78 years of age. She fell on the dance floor dancing at her daughter's wedding, which I think is kind of awesome in some ways that she's staying very active. But um, uh, she fell, which is unfortunate. And she was um, unable to walk after the fall, complained of moderate pain about her left groin and thigh. And upon examination, they felt that she had good range of motion in the left hip. And that's the side that she fell on, uh, although it was painful. No deformity was noted. So post x-ray, this is uh, MG, 78 years of age. Um, well, well, this is interesting. So this is the hip she fell on, which is the left side. This is the patient's right side. She actually already had a nine-year-old total hip reconstruction done. And I mean, so this is a very active lady and she's fallen now twice. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the right hip. You can see the arrows that I've listed here that are kind of following this percoteric, uh, uh, protroca, protrochanteric fracture, excuse me. This is a fracture between the trochanters or in the intertrochanteric region. Um, so that's right down this groove, protrochanteric uh, fracture. I don't know why I can't say that word today. But under um, higher magnification view or a alternative view from the lateral aspect, you can, I think, appreciate uh, more substantially where these fractures are. The appliance that was used is not a total hip. It actually utilizes uh, the native architecture of the femoral head and the acetabular socket. Uh, and, and so this is drilled out. This, re this uh, reinforcement device is placed in two screws on the distal aspect to actually hold this in place. From the lateral view, you can see, and here's that fracture right here. So now what I want you to uh, think through are these questions. And, and we would have done this in class, but um, this patient is currently on aspirin and Coumadin. And, and Coumadin is a anticoagulant. And aspirin is, is a over-the-counter type of pain reliever, but it has anticoagulant type of activities. 
She does have high blood pressure. I mean, she's 78 years of old, so that years of age. So that's not surprising. Um, but I want you to think through what type of gait issues do you expect this patient uh, will experience post-surgery and then maybe six to nine months after healing. Okay, so that's question number one. So go ahead and pause uh, the recording if you want to just think through uh, gait issues or how difficult will it be for her to walk? That's what that question is asking. Okay, now that you're back, um, let's talk about the next question. Uh, what type of dietary suggestions might you suggest? Okay, the last question. So three questions. The last question is, any types of exercise that you would recommend for this patient? And then we're going to go through the three answers here in a second. So go ahead and pause the recording and think through an exercise regime for MG. That's the patient's initials. Okay, so let's back up. Um, walking or gait issues. So it's probably going to be painful at first to walk probably pretty obvious. Um, likely the patient's going to need some sort of, uh, from a wheelchair to a walker to a cane, you know, with like four um, contact point cane on the floor, uh, probably in PT, getting practice with balance. Uh, we're talking a few weeks after surgery, it's probably in a wheelchair doing uh, seated types of activities. The sooner we can get MG into a standing position safely in a walker and putting weight on her hip, her hips both, the better. Why? Why would that be good for her to be weight bearing? Now, if you answered because the bone is going to remodel based upon the forces that it's placed under, like Wolf's Law, you'd be right. So from a PT standpoint, do we want MG sitting and laying in bed for a long time? Not really. We actually want her safely and not too early, but when she can handle it, we want her to start putting weight on this hip so that we get a nice incorporation of this new device. Okay, let's move to dietary uh, suggestions. So you might be saying, okay, what about calcium and vitamin D supplementation? Uh, I, I would agree. I would totally agree. Um, some other ideas would be um, like spinach um, and dark leafy green vegetables because they um, they can um, uh, help uh, with um, uh, overall diet um, uh, modulation on the bone, but they're very, very high in vitamin K. And so we have to be a little careful here because vitamin K has a known interference with drugs that are anticoagulants like Coumadin. And so we might need to limit her amount of intake of vitamin K rich food. So that's something to be thinking through. So I would say vitamin D um, and um, uh, calcium supplementation. And maybe while, while vitamin K is great, she might have too much of it uh, and have an interaction, negative interaction with her Coumadin. Okay, uh, exercises. Uh, let's talk about early on. So early on, uh, getting her out of a wheelchair, like we were talking about, and doing, you know, once, once the surgical sites have healed and she's been cleared for bathing or showering or can get into a swimming pool, some water therapy is probably going to be a very early first step, right? Because in, in water, we don't have as, as much weight um, we, we, our mass is the same, but the perceived weight is displaced with the water or somewhat buoyant. And so that's a great place for her to start moving. It's low impact, almost zero impact. She can practice range of motion balance with her hand on the, on the, on the side of the pool. So water therapy, you know, again, once the surgical sites have healed will be a first go-to, and then we'll probably be getting her out of the pool. And this is a lot of your future is gonna be dealing or, or helping patients like MG. And so I just wanted to walk through kind of this one case study uh, from start to finish so you kind of see how this plays out. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, the last study that I wanna talk about, not a case study, but this is a research experiment. This is a research experiment in a mouse model 
by some of the fathers of tissue engineering, um, Langer and Vacanti. And it was uh, their understudy, Lanza, that published this in 2000. So, I mean, this is a 23-year-old paper. But what we have here is we've got another uh, piece of insight for you of what will probably be coming in the future. So these were rat mesenchymal stem cells that they harvested, and they were looking at a bone regeneration model. So what they did is they actually, if you look at the bottom panel, it's a little easier to see. Uh, this bottom panel, these are x-rays in black and white. And let's start with the empty defect. They actually cut a defect in the bone, and you can sort of appreciate this gap, this black gap between the two ends of the bone, and it's been reinforced with a plate. And over time, eight weeks later, you can see a little bit of a halo of new bone growing in. After eight, uh, 16 weeks, you can see that the ends have new bone growing in. There's a little bit of a halo here. But if we compare that to the mesenchymal stem cell loaded scaffolding, so this is a hyaluronic acid tricalcium phosphate scaffold. It's kind of like a carrier. And they infused it with stem cells. And they implanted this plug in this defect at day zero. And you can see after eight weeks, it's incorporated into the adjacent bone. And after 16 weeks, you can still appreciate the cylinder of mesenchymal stem cell, HA, tricalcium phosphate plug, but it's been nicely incorporated onto the margins of native bone. And this over here, this is a control group whoops, sorry, this is a control group that had no cells. So what, what they're concluding here is that stem cells helped the bone to mature quicker. And now we're in an age of a lot of stem cell-based therapies. And this is, a, this is an old study. This is two decades old. And I just wanted to show you that some of these people were thinking about how we can incorporate these novel techniques into patient care. I mean, this was a rat. Uh, preclinical model. It wasn't in patients, but this is where it starts. And so many of you may be clinically working with stem cell-based therapies like this to help patients like MG that we just walked through. We're going to migrate to um, bone health. And I, I really, in this section, want to make sure that we kind of take home or, or I equip you with some take-home messages about why bone health is so important. It's really an interplay. It's an interplay or a connection between resorption, um, whether it's excessive resorption um, and the balance between that and new bone being formed. And, and then this period of time in our life when we reach our peak bone mass. And so I, I, these are the three things that are really important for you to take home uh, today in the last portion of this lecture. So let me ask this question, bone health and calcium, which is the most important age range for taking action to prevent osteoporosis? So again, the most important age range for taking action to prevent osteoporosis. Is it early years, zero to 20? Is it your 20 to 40 years of age, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, 61 to 80? So if you, if you look at D, you can eliminate this one maybe by saying, hey, it, it, it's too late. You know, your peak bone mass has already come and gone. 41 to 60, right? Well, I'll tell you what, you're actually still, your peak bone mass has already happened. 21 to 40. Well, 21 to 40 actually happens to be your peak bone mass. But at that point, it's a little too late. The most important age range is the early years, zero to 20, because you're trying to build as much bone as you can possibly get before it starts to drop off. So take a look at this graph. So from about the age of birth to 20, 21 years of age, you're on this curve where you're, you're really building bone mass. And then from 21 to, you know, about early 40s, before you get to 50, but early to mid 40s, you're at this plateau. 
and nothing really changes. And then once you kind of, you know, go over the hill, so to speak, according to this graph, you start losing bone mass. And in women, this acceleration increases at the point of menopause, which is usually in the early to mid fifties. So I'm trying to really impress on you that, you know, these early years, and this is one of the reasons you see so much research and so much effort on um, childhood education and lunch programs and having milk in schools and, you know, vitamin supplementation for our um, pediatric children. Because once we get to a certain point, you're kind of past the point of no return. All right, let me just stop the share for a second and make sure that we've got, okay, the right screen. I wanna make sure we're on the right screen. Um, this next graph is gonna highlight um, a little bit of this process as we, as we get older. And the way to think about this is, the amount of uh, calcium and bone density is kind of like a bank and you make withdrawals later in life. And so in the early phase of life, you're making deposits. And so if you look at this graph, what I want you to be able to appreciate is if you're on path A, where you've started with a higher bone density, when you hit menopause, this drop off throughout your lifetime will keep you above the high risk or out of the high risk category, I should probably say. Whereas if you start off by reaching menopause at a lower bone density, this is when you run into a risk area. There are some things you can do to stay in low risk, uh, like exercise, diet modifications, weight bearing exercise, uh, vitamin supplementation. So those are good things. But again, the biggest determinant of prevention is starting out with more bone density, okay? Now, if we talk about men, you know, let's be um, uh, equal to the sexes here and talk about men. They do get osteoporosis, but just they're not as high of risk because uh, later in life, they don't have the sudden drop off of sex hormone that women do. They do have a loss in um, testosterone and even the estrogen that is in men, um, although it being very, very low. However, they don't have this monster decline that has like a, a definitive time point. So if you look at this graph and you look at the age, women have this characteristic cliff and men just have this slow decline that typically keeps them above the high risk category or out of the high risk category. Plus they tend to start because they have more bone density and more lean body mass. There are just Typically with men, there's more muscle mass. Those muscles pull on the bones. They create more bone, higher bone density. Men tend to hit their 20s to 40s with a higher level of bone density than women. Okay, so their drop off is more gradual and they start with a little bit more. Now, some risk factors for both men and women. Uh, alcohol, smoking, uh, long-term corticosteroid use, these all negatively impact bone density. But of the 10 million people that we talked about in the United States with osteoporosis, only 2 million are men, and that means 8 million are women. All right. Now, there is some variations that also exist with, um, oh, I didn't answer this question. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to this question. I didn't, I didn't uh, throw this question up here yet. So given this graph, what is the average bone mass for men in their 80s? And these are some examples of, of types of questions you might see on the exam uh, next week. So if you, if you just read this graph, you look at age, it's on the um, x-axis, and you look at uh, bone mass, uh, total mass of calcium. Um, this is bone mass, and it's going from 0 to 1,500 at the top. And if you say, OK, in their 80s, they're right about here. You're not going to go to this pink line, which is women. You're going to go to this dark line, which is men, and come over to this axis, which should equate with about what? 1,300 grams. So the answer would be C. Okay, let's look at another one. Now, 
We also don't see uh, just see differences between men and women. We see differences between di different ethnic groups, um, mild differences, but there are differences. And so uh, on this graph, um, if we look at data that's uh, uh, categorized by male, female, and then white, black, or Hispanic, uh, I want you to look at the average or report the average hip bone mineral density, BMD, of a black male at the age of 70. So again, on this graph is age, uh, this axis, this X axis. On the Y axis is total hip bone mineral density in milligrams per square centimeter. So let's go to a 70 year old. And then on this chart, uh, we've got a black male, which is the filled in circles. So come up here to the filled in circles, puts us at just underneath 1.0, I would say 0.98 would be the best answer. I would say that over less than 0.9 because that's telling me it's below 0.9. 0.9 would be down here. And we're all the way up here. Does that make sense? So 0.9, get rid of that box. 0.9 is this line and 1.0 is this line. That's why I went with 0.98 versus, so B versus E. Okay, next question. Um, so if females are the category that's uh, at highest risk, this is a reasonable question. Do uh, females consume enough calcium? Now, this is a little antiquated data. It's a little outdated, but the trends have continued. Um, I mean, this is published data uh, back, you know, about 20 years ago, but not much has really changed in the way that we um, uh, educate uh, young individuals. And so if you look at early life and the, the um, solid line, is adequate intake. And you can see the solid line here is below the boxed line. The boxed line is what we're, what we're having. And so for the first, you know, I would say, you know, 10 years of life, we do a really good job of either exceeding or meeting the requirement for females. But once we hit adolescence and teenage years, we get this huge spike in the need for calcium in our diet. And with females specifically, we're not getting enough. So if we look, oh, I was on the wrong. Uh, so th th let me, let me re uh, restate that because my cursor was on the wrong screen. If we look at the solid line, this is the amount that's needed daily. If we look at this boxed line, this is the amount that we're getting. And we're talking about females. So in the early years, up until about teenage years, 10 years of, of age, uh, 10, 11 years of age, we're either exceeding or meeting the daily need. But in our teenage years, in, in females' teenage years, we see a, a, a spike of, of calcium needs per day that just seems to plateau. And so we have this gap. We have this gap and the teenagers and those that are above 50 years of age, that's what this is saying, need 1200 milligrams of calcium according to the daily recommended allowances. And in this graph before that I showed you, um, we're, we're down here at, at about 800 and dropping. And we need this here to be at or above 1200 for our teenagers and our 50 plusers. So that's a big issue. And then from 20 to 50, we need about a thousand, we're below that. And you have to remember the reason that we recommend so much is it's not super efficient, it's not perfect. Less than 30% of the calcium that we consume is actually absorbed. The rest tends to be lost by secretion or just inefficiencies where we, we don't reabsorb it quick enough and it's lost in the urine on a daily basis. Okay, <clears throat> let me ask this question. Uh, what's your favorite soda? And, and I promise there's gonna be a, a connection. So you've got Coke or Pepsi, and I put the diets in that category, more Coke with lime, 
cherry coke, all that. You got root beer or diets, Seven Up, Sprite, Fresca, Dr. Pepper, Mr. Pibb, some other dark colored soda or some other light colored soda or G. I, I don't really drink soda. So the reason I'm asking this question is really for our school age kids and our teenagers is, and, and, and it'll come to light. What does this have to do with bone health? So if we look at this study, uh, this was a, a study called uh, Framingham Osteoporosis Study. And this was looking at the consumption of cola, soda, servings per week. So here you're at, you know, a, cola, a, a, a soda pop a day, a Coke a day, Pepsi a day. And this was a older patient population, not our teenagers, but I think you can extrapolate to a young population. <clears throat> so if you look at the y-axis, this is the femoral neck. This is where MG had her injury and her fracture. And this is the bone mineral density. And you can see in these older women in this study, those that didn't have any soda had significantly higher bone density than women who had one soda a day. Let me say that again. In this study of older women, Framingham Osteoporosis Study, it discovered that in older women, their bone mineral density in their femoral neck at their hip was significantly higher who did not drink any soda versus women who had a soda a day. Now, even women that had, that's what these asterisks are, even women that actually said, well, I don't drink a soda today. Maybe I drink a one every other day, or I drink like four or five a week. They would be in this category. They also had significantly lower bone mineral density than women who didn't drink soda at all. It wasn't until the women that, that reported, well, I, I drink three or less sodas a week that it wasn't statistically different, but still lower. And again, if you had one a week, well, you're almost the same as having none. So I'm not saying don't drink soda, but maybe minimize the amount of soda that you're drinking. Now, why? What, what's going on here? Okay. Well, there's some theories. So one theory is that those that consume soda aren't consuming other positive things, like they're not drinking enough milk or dairy products. They're not getting calcium and vitamin D from other sources. They're actually having soda pop instead. Um, why the back of this can where you've got phosphoric acid here as one of the ingredients on the back of this can. And what's interesting is, you know, that's going to lead to uh, phosphorus uh, being available in the bloodstream. And, and that's actually not a bad thing because it's an important bone mineral. But if you get disproportionate amounts of phosphorus and not enough calcium, you're not going to build enough of the organic matrix. Or, I'm sorry, the inorganic matrix. Um, then the last theory is with relation to caffeine. There's been a long um, standing uh, thought process in the literature that caffeine can interfere with calcium absorption. And so maybe if you're gonna have soda, have one that doesn't have phosphoric acid, maybe have one that's not dark in color, right? Uh, or, or is caffeine free, I should say. And maybe have one, treat yourself to one or two a week, right? Or just find something else to drink, have a, have a glass of water. Right. Okay. There was a um, a study, a teenager study. That's different from this study, but I want to talk about it. That's uh, right here under this bullet point. On this teenager study, they looked at ninth and tenth grade girls who drank soda. They're three times more likely to have bone fractures than those that don't have carbonated beverages. So again, a different study in young patients, not in older men, older women, but they're in uh, younger women. And there's this correlation between soda and bone challenges. And now why do I have women versus men? Well, this is looking at women. And I would say that all of these would apply to men. They're just more exaggerated in women because of the fact that women over time are more susceptible to developing an osteoporotic situation. 
Okay. All right. Last study before we conclude. Talking about exercise. So this is an interesting study. This was a study that was done in Finland, and it recruited uh, women, uh, adult women, uh, tennis and squash players. Okay. It's a study done in the 90s, like 1995. You can see down here the source, 1995, Canis et al. And what this study was looking at is, if I look at bone mineral density between their playing arm and their non-playing arm, or their dominant and their non-dominant, and I look at the differences between the two, because if they're tennis or squash players, their dominant arm, let's say they're right-handed, their dominant right-handed arm is used more. And the bone's going to remodel based upon the stresses it's placed under. So their dominant arm should have a higher bone mineral density than their non-dominant. So if you look at controls and you look at this first bar, you can see controls after puberty, before puberty. And this is when rigorous training happens or exercise. And then you look at the percent difference. That's what we're looking at. So in controls that aren't you know, regular individuals that don't play tennis or squash on a regular basis, there was about a 3% difference in bone mineral density between their dominant and non-dominant arm. Now, if you took the squash players um, <clears throat> who didn't start playing until after puberty, tennis and squash players, their difference was right around, you know, 7%. So obviously after puberty, uh, most of their bone mineral has been formed, but exercise will increase bone density. But look at this bar. If they started playing tennis or squash before puberty, they started loading their bones with forces before puberty, 21, 22% difference in bone mineral density between their playing arm and their non-playing arm. So what does that tell you? The take-home message here is physical activity is beneficial. It's beneficial on our older patients because it's weight bearing, it's weight loading, the bones are modeled based upon the forces they're placed under. But if we can capture young kids and put them into an exercise regime with good diets, then we're gonna make the biggest impact public health wise, okay? That's all I had for you today. Uh, just a summary of what we talked about, bone repair, bone disease, looking at osteoporosis and demineralization. We incorporated a lot of Wolf's Law in today's lecture, and then we talked an awful lot about public health or this medical health data that I talked about. So um, thank you for listening and um, enjoy the snow. Stay warm. I'll see you on Monday for our exam too. Take care.